Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to SUNY Poly's Graduate Student Research Showcase. I'm Krista Thompson, Assistant Dean of Graduate Studies. Uh, today's presentations will be provided by PhD students in nanoscale science, nanoscale engineering, and nanobioscience. Um, I, at the conclusion of the presentations, you will have the opportunity to ask the students questions. So um, I'd ask you to, to hold those questions until um, until the end. Um, so without further ado, um, I will ask Pujitha to um, begin with the presentations. Yeah. I'm Pujitha Ramesh. I'm a fourth year a PhD student right now. And I'm being advised by both Dr. Susan Shastin and Dr. Yu Bing Shi. Um, the kind of project that I work on now is very interdisciplinary. It has um, a background from physics, chemistry, bio, and engineering. And um, I originally am from an electrical engineering background, and I wanted to branch out into uh, bioengineering. So this was uh, a perfect program for me to um, kind of test the waters, see what I like, and then join a project that I uh, really was into. So my thesis work is titled Biomimetic Scaffolds Targeting Remediation of Fibrosis and Regeneration of the Salivary Gland. So fibrosis is a condition, is a chronic condition that can occur in any part of the human body. And what it is essentially is wound healing gone wrong. So whenever there is an injury in the body, what happens is that there is something called extracellular matrix that is deposited and cells come and infiltrate that region to form the functional part of the gland. So cells are not free floating, they're embedded in this matrix that provides key mechanical and biochemical cues. And so when there's an injury, there's ECM deposition to fill that void. When wound healing goes wrong, what happens is that there's excess ECM, uh, extracellular matrix or ECM being deposited. And because of that, the cells are not able to infiltrate this region. And instead of forming functional tissue, there's just some useless scar tissue that's being formed. Uh, apart from being uh, useless uh, in that region, the scar tissue also um, affects the rest of the organ uh, in a negative manner and the healthy cells uh, then change their phenotype from healthy as shown here to diseased because of the excess ECM and um, the organ starts losing parts, uh, parts of its function. So the organ we are interested in is the salivary gland and fibrosis in the salivary gland as shown here uh, causes reduced production of saliva. So the cells lose their phenotype and start secreting lesser saliva as shown here. Traditional therapies have been uh, directed to increase saliva production, but not uh, treat the root cause of this problem. And the issue with traditional therapies have been that um, they've not been very effective in, in increasing saliva production. And oftentimes the side effects of these medications are much worse than the symptoms of the condition itself. And so what we proposed as part of this thesis work is an alternative uh, therapeutic strategy wherein we attack this problem at the root uh, level and try to uh, res uh, restore the function of the gland by regenerating part of the gland and remediating fibrosis. So the way we plan to do that is by uh, implanting mesenchymal stem cells. Traditionally, mesenchymal stem cells are injected into the bloodstream for therapy, but then what happens in that case is that majority of the cells are cleared out and do not reach our target site of interest. And even the ones that do, they do not engraft uh, into the organ uh, as well as we'd like it to. So a very small percentage of them survive and engraft into the organ. So the strategy we've proposed is to um, fabricate a scaffold which will house these MSCs and we'll implant the cell uh, scaffold construct into our target site of interest to improve engraftment and to uh, both help the MSCs retain their phenotype uh, and also to provide uh, an empty matrix to a certain extent for the cells in the organ to infiltrate and regenerate uh, part of the function. So when we want to fabricate a scaffold that has um, the properties of the 
uh, native extracellular matrix, we want to ensure that um, it has enough porosity. The pore sizes should be of the order of about uh, 10 to 30 microns because cells are usually in the order of uh, 10 to 20 microns. And these pores should be interconnected so the cells can infiltrate and form a mass of tissue. The matrix should also have an insoluble backbone, which is uh, stiff to a certain extent to support the cells, but also soluble cushion that will cushion the cells. Um, the matrix should also have uh, enough cell attachment sites so the cells attach to the matrix, because if they don't attach, then the cells eventually end up dying. Apart from these properties, the matrix should also be viscoelastic. It should have a certain amount of stiffness and elasticity. Um, usually in the order of 100 to 300 pascals. So if you look at current state-of-the-art scaffolds, they don't have all of these properties concurrently. And that is why we set out to uh, fabricate a scaffold which has all of these properties. And we used a technique called cryogenic electrospinning. And we modified the technique to produce not just three-dimensional scaffolds, but also scaffolds that had pore sizes um, of the right uh, size and had in interconnected pores. So uh, we did that. We were able to uh, mimic um, the native exocellular matrix kind of topographically and in terms of pore size. But we also had to check, um, and we were able to incorporate both insoluble backbone and soluble cushion components. But we also had to check if the matrix had the right viscoelastic property. So we tested that um, with the native adult decelerized gland as shown here. And we found out that um, the cryolipters on sponges, shown as CES H here, uh, had uh, similar stiffness and relaxation time. And this was a huge result for us because um, the matrix was able to mimic the um, native extracellular matrix in a majority of the ways. So after characterizing our scaffolds, we went ahead to grow cells in our scaffolds to see if the cells attached and remained alive. And uh, thankfully for us, majority of them were alive on our scaffold with very few cells dying. And um, when we tested for um, cell function on our scaffolds using two different cell types, the cells were able to express the proteins that they need to to maintain their cell function and uh, they remain healthy. So um, like I said in the beginning, this project was very interdisciplinary and um, this is a very short list of uh, people who are directly involved in the project. And so I'd like to thank them for all of their uh, input and contribution. And thank you for your time. Um, hi everyone, my name is Nushin Amini. I'm a fifth year PhD student in Dr. Perry's lab. I have my BS. Um, in biomedical engineering and I got my master's in nanotechnology and here I work on bioengineered platforms for human stem cell based diagnostic and therapeutic um, interventions. So human stem cells have showed great potential in various fields. One is regenerative medicine for bone disorders, diabetes, heart failure and such and they can be seated on multiple platforms based on their application. So they can be seated on um, polymeric scaffolds as Pujita was talking about they can also be in hydrogels or semi-permeable uh, membranes for transplantation. They can also be used for disease modeling and drug discovery, whether in 2D on a petri dish or 3D as organoids. Um, they can also be seeded on microfluidic devices for cell analysis, like multiplex protein detection or um, single cell analysis. Um, so for my project, we focus on two of these applications. First one is mass production of insulin producing HIPSC derived pancreatic cells. So as you probably know, the main treatment for diabetes is um, insulin injections. So patient has to monitor the level of insulin daily and take doses of in insulin sometimes multiple times per day. An alternative approach can be using um, cell therapy. The idea is that you can inject healthy beta cells which are responsible for production of insulin in the body to the patient. So it doesn't need any insert injection or anything. Um, one issue with that is that you need a high number of cells per patient. So you need to mass produce these cells. One way to do it is use traditional Petri dish um, and use 2D methods. Another one is using bioreactors as 3D methods. Here we are focusing on 3D approach. Um, we generated pancreatic cells from human-induced pluripotent stem cells. 
and seated them on scaffolds with six different modifications to find the perfect um, surface chemistry for cell attachment, viability, and also expansion. And we were actually able to identify a surface that gave us tenfold expansion of these cells and threefold um, insulin production in the bioreactor in comparison to the dish. And here in the um, image, you can actually see these cells. In the SCN image, you can see the cells on the scaffold. And you can see the production of extracellular matrix that shows the cells are adapting to their environment and they are actually viable on these scaffolds. Um, and for the second project, we are focusing on multiplex analysis on neural cell cell interaction microchip. So here we are actually using neural rosettes. These are stem cells that are committed to neuronal lineage and they can actually um, differentiate to multiple types of neurons if the right um, signaling factor is in the environment. Um, these rosettes have been used in studies for treatment for neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer or Parkinson's disease. Um, but one issue is that each lab uses them at different conditions. So some labs use them as dissociated single cells, others use them as whole rosettes or aggregates. And no one has really looked at the difference that it makes in the production of cytokines of these cells. Why these cytokines are important is because these cytokines can actually activate or inhibit specific signaling pathways in a cell that can uh, determine the fate of the cells. Um, so to look at the cytokine production of these cells, we seeded them on a PDMS microchip and enclosed it with an array. This array had a, a layer of microbes that had DNA and complementary antibodies tethered to it. What you can do with this array is that you can actually capture the released cytokines in each um, individual chamber without um, disturbing the microenvironment of the cells. And here we were able to identify 10 different cytokines secreted of these cells in each chamber at different conditions as dissociated cells, aggregates, and also whole rosettes on the chip. Um, the good thing about this platform is that you can use it for any type of cells really. So right now we are using them for uh, looking at differentiation of neurons at different stages to find the um, cytokines, the specific cytokines at each stage. Um, and you can also take phase and fluorescent images on the same platform, again, without the need to transfer the cells to any other um, surface, cover slips, or anything like that. Um, and later, we are going to injure these neurons that we are actually uh, studying right now um, to look at uh, traumatic brain injury um, cytokine production and uh, compare that to healthy cells. Um, these two projects were funded by NYSTEM and NFSSCTR. Our bioreactor for the first project was fabricated by Dr. Saxena at Separation Corporation, and the array was designed by Dr. Wang at Stony Brook um, University. Thank you. Hi, my name is Christopher Netspand. I work for Professor Dunn on improving chemical mechanical polishing slurries for CM, uh, semiconductor applications. CMP slurries are used to create flat surfaces for semiconductors. On the left is an image of a semiconductor without CMP performed, and the right has CMP performed. These flat surfaces allow for the addition of more metal lines, easing the scaling to smaller devices. CMP is really a process of polishing where the wafer is pressed against a rotating pad that has an slurry on it with abrasives and chemicals. The simplest slurry can have water, abrasives, and pH adjusters, but other chemicals are added. The slurry that I use uses the abrasive Syria, and I also add oxidizing agents to it to improve its performance. In our experiments to improve performance, we found that the key factor is the percentage of Syria 3 plus oxidation state on the particle surface. Syria is redox active and can switch between the 3 and 4 plus state. Traditionally, this 3 plus percentage is maximized by going to smaller particle sizes, shown in this graph on the right, where the initial values go up as the particle size decreases. We found that by mimicking the enzyme catalase, additions of peroxide can increase the three plus percentage of larger particles. In this way, the black line, we can, through controlled addition, make the three plus percentage of a large particle equivalent to that of the small one. This allows us to maximize both chemical removal and the mechanical removal during polishing. 
for actual polishing results, we polished silicon oxide, which is a traditional target for serious slurry. And you see that the highest removal rate comes at that point that had the highest serious three plus percentage. Well, at the same time, the values that we achieved in removal rate were many times higher than that of slurries that are used on the market today. Now, I talked about how flatness was important, so we also measured that through AFM. And you can see there is a dramatic uh, smoothing of the surface from the unpolished and commercial to our improved slurry. The addition of oxidizing agents that we did for improving the slurry also allows our slurry to be used for uh, different polishing materials other than silicon oxide. One example is use polishing different metals, in this case ruthenium. We again see that our improved slurry has about a three times removal rate of a commercial ruthenium slurry, which instead of the seria we use has silica as its abrasive. Moving to the roughness results, the three pictures look the same, but the scale goes from instead of the 38.4 uh, scale on the unpolished, it's only about a 10 nanometer scale for the series, for the improved slurry. So again, we've had a, a large improvement on the uh, flatness of the surface after polishing. In summary, the Serious slurries can be improved by understanding their chemical environments and by getting a better understanding of the underlying me mechanisms in your uh, material or um, research, you can design better uh, final products. Uh, we show this by uh, polishing a silicon oxide faster and smoother than a you standard commercial slurry. And we also were able to polish new materials, basically metals. I showed ruthenium, but we also polished tungsten and copper with it. For acknowledgements, I'd like to thank my group members, the uh, people in the metrology department, the school, and SUMCO for funding my research. Thank you. Uh, my name is Maximilian Lear. Uh, I am a second year grad student at SUNY Poly, and I'm gonna be talking about resistive memory reram research at SUNY Poly. So when we think of, of data analysis, uh, it has been increasing exponentially uh, in recent years and is continuing to do that in foreseeable future. And one of those main sources of data has been sensor data, which is a largely short-term data. Now, I want you to imagine a self-driving car and it comes up to a stop sign. It needs to not only uh, quickly, but accurately depict that it is a stop sign. So the need for a current and future architecture to handle these large amounts of data quickly will become central. And one of the bottlenecks that we're currently facing is in our memory processing speed. So the main idea is that this input of a, a stop sign needs to go into the processing unit. And then during this processing of finding out if it actually is seeing a stop sign, it needs to possibly go and uh, collect um, uh, data from the memory. And this uh, interchange between the processing unit and memory is a large lag time in, in, in this scenario because they're in separate regions to then finally output that yes, this is a stop sign. So one of the things that we can do is remove the entire idea of having memory as a separate component and incorporate local memory at the processing unit so that there's a much shorter uh, lag time between uh, processes. So reram memristors are one of the things that I'm working on at, at SUNY Poly. And the basic idea, what you can think of, is that uh, you can believe that it is uh, similar to a capacitor in the idea that it has a top and bottom electrode and a metal oxide in between. Now, the reram memristors have two main states that it wants to switch between. It is either a low resistive state where the bottom and top electrode through this metal oxide insulator level region right here can be created to have a metal bridge, if you will, between the top and bottom electrode, causing electrons to be able to move uh, very easily between them and giving it a low resistive state. 
The other, uh, vice versa, the other state that we can get is a high resistive state. Now what happens here is that the oxygen can be brought back in to break it up to make it more of an insulator again, breaking the bridge and causing the electrons have more difficulty to be moving between the top and bottom electrode. Now this represents a high resistive state. Now to get this uh, separate uh, these states to switch back and forth is just a variability in the voltages where we get to a certain limit of a positive voltage, it can switch to LRS and then certain negative voltage, you can switch to an HRS. Now the potential of these devices uh, is pretty uh, fantastic and the idea that one of the major ones is that can allow it can store synaptic weight and this means that say I want to put it in a specific LRS state and no matter how many times I read it in the future I'm going to be able to always see that specific state uh, and I can switch to another state and read it again and 10, 10 20 years later I'll be able to read it again that's the, the prime potential of these devices another one is that it actually has a lower uh, power requirement than traditional non-volatile uh, elements, meaning at, at area and power requirements, meaning that we're able to put more of them in there and at more efficient uh, rates than other uh, non-volatile elements. Um, non-volatile meaning that it can maintain its, its specific resistance. Another good thing is the fact that it can uh, perform uh, analog uh, uh, meaning that we can not only switch just between the two states of LRS and HRS, we can switch in between those states as well, meaning that we're not limited to just a binary one and zero between high and low, we're actually able to put multiple levels in between. So all this has been done and fabricated at our SUNY Polyfab, where we have a 300 millimeter wafer using our current 65 nanometer CMOS memristor process. and uh, the, this allows for in-house use of the clean rooms and uh, through these processes I've done some uh, work such as creating a picture in an 8x8 array uh, from AFRL which is one of our sponsors uh, showcasing that this device can be uh, these devices can be put into a specific resistance value and they can be kept at that value and then looked at over and over again. So uh, in conclusion, reram devices allow a bypass of separate locations for memory, allowing for faster processing. They have a lower power consumption and a smaller area, which makes it a very good component to be used for local memory. Uh, so I, I would like to acknowledge AFRL for sponsoring this, uh, the, the funding me specifically, and uh, all the other KD Lab members that have been helping with this. Uh, so I'm gonna hand it now off to Emma and uh, thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. My name's uh, Tristan Head, and my undergraduate degree was in physics over at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm a third-year PhD student in nanoengineering under Dr. Nate Cady, and I'm also an RNA fellow through the RNA Institute at UAlbany. Uh, the title of my research is Microfluidic Platform for Integrated Reagent Delivery and In Vivo Imaging, and it focuses on developing implantable microfluidic chips for drug delivery studies in mice. This diagram shows a breakdown of my work, including device design and fabrication, characterization and computational simulations, as well as validation in three different model systems. Now, the goal of my research is to uh, improve our understanding of cancer. Tumors are complex environments and the behavior of individual tumor cells is highly independent, highly dependent on the signals they receive from their surroundings. Uh, an important pathway for the spread of cancer is this process called metastasis. Here, cancer cells acquire the ability to leave their uh, initial original tumor, travel through the bloodstream, and start tum tumors in other parts of the body. And this is important because metastasis is thought to be responsible for about 90% of cancer mortality, but the events surrounding this process are not well understood. Uh, this is partially because uh, recreating tumors in petri dishes is very difficult to do, and animal models uh, have many barriers to uh, studying this process as well. To overcome these challenges, we've developed the microfluidic intravital window, which is an implantable uh, device that is uh, compatible with live animal imaging and is able to perfuse reagents for biochemical studies. Uh, the windows can be in mouse for weeks, allowing for longitudinal studies that better capture cancer progression as opposed to subpopulation sampling. In the middle here is a close up of one of these windows that we make in our clean rooms. And here's a video of Gonna play this time. 
Yes. Here's a video of the device injecting fluorescent molecules into live tissue. So up here is the outlet, and down here is the, the cells in the tumor itself. So the next portion of my research is focused on capturing the performance of these devices using computational modeling. By visualizing the uh, drug concentration profile in these models, I can tune injection parameters to improve drug penetration and the volume of tumor that reaches clinically relevant doses. Uh, this data can then be used to inform injection in live animals to evaluate the optimal conditions for drug delivery in solid tumors. So to wrap up, my work uses device design and fabrication, as well as computational modeling to enhance biochemical studies in vivo. In the future, I'll be using this data to predict drug delivery in cell culture and in vivo models to enable high resolution biochemical studies in the tumor microenvironment. This video here shows that uh, once we've uh, implanted these windows, we can put the mouse back in its cage and uh, it'll happily do all of its typical mouse things, uh, climbing around, nesting, all those things. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge the people at SUNY Poly that have been a part of this project, especially my PI, Dr. Nate Cady. I'd also like to thank my collaborators at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, the Condylas Lab, and the Edinburgh Lab, as well as my funding sources at NIH and the RNA Institute at UAlbany. Hi, everyone. My name is Emma Rocco. I'm a fourth year PhD student at SUNY Poly. Um, my undergraduate degree um, was a BS in engineering science and a minor in physics from Smith College. Um, and now my PhD research work um, is on the impact of surface polarity on the quantum efficiency of cesium-free three nitride photocathodes under the advisement of Dr. Shahida Porasanvik. And um, this work is a collaboration with NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So photocathode detectors are a type of photodetector which utilize the photo emission process. Um, so in these devices, you'd have light that would hit the semiconductor surface and the light would transfer its energy to excite an electron in the material. And the electron would then travel to the surface of the material and if it has enough energy, it can escape over the energy barrier and be collected by this electrode and counted um, as a proxy for the amount of light that hits your detector. So photocathodes have a wide variety of applications in astronomy for mapping the intergalactic medium and determining the composition of planets and stars. It also has applications um, for military, such as missile detection, non-line of sight communication, and in image intensifiers, as shown here in the bottom left. The three nitride material system is particularly well suited for these UV photocathodes as it has a wide and tunable band gap that lies within the UV spectrum. Additionally, the material is very chemically inert and radiation hard, which means that it will have high reliability and a long lifetime. The three nitride material system specifically is the crystal wurzite structure and as a result of that, um, there's a spontaneous polarization charge within the three nitride material system, which means that you can grow the material in the gallium polarity or in the nitrogen polarity or any number of semipolar and nonpolar orientations in between. And each one of those orientations will have its own specific polarization charge. And what that means for us is that with those different charges, it will have a different energy barrier at the surface. So in our case, we found that the nitrogen polar orientation shown here in this band diagram um, has a lower uh, vacuum energy compared to the bulk of the material. So it's a better uh, material for our devices. All of our photocathode devices are going to need to use a P-type material to get downward surface band bending of those band structures. But there's many challenges um, to achieving this p-type doping. Magnesium is the most common p-type dopant in the three nitride material system, but it suffers from self-compensation at high concentrations of magnesium by forming nitrogen vacancies to alleviate stress. And additionally, once you uh, add more magnesium than the solid solubility limit, cluster defects form. So we can see in these atom probe uh, tomography reconstructions that at low concentrations of magnesium, the magnesium is very well dispersed in the film, but at high magnesium concentrations, it 
forms these cluster defects, which are electrically inactive. So it won't be helping us get more of this p-type material. There are additional challenges in the nitrogen polar orientation, um, specifically that they form these hexagonal hillock structures, which have semipolar facets. And there's an increased incorporation of unintentional donor impurities, namely oxygen. However, these hillock structures provide us an opportunity um, as it's been shown previously that there's an increased incorporation of magnesium at step edges and in semipolar planes. So to test our hypothesis that we can incorporate more magnesium and get a higher p-type material by incorporating magnesium into these hillock structures that are common on the nitrogen polar material, we grew two identical photocathode structures by metal organic chemical vapor deposition. We grew one on a low hillock density nitrogen polar film and one on a high hillock density film. And we did photo emission spectroscopy measurements to determine the efficiency of our devices as a function of the photon energy um, that it's absorbing. And we found that the sample that was grown on the high hillock density um, film achieved a high quantum efficiency of 24%, while the photocathode grown on low hillock density film only achieved 6% quantum efficiency. To further understand why the magnesium incorporated better into these hillock structures, we also looked at atom probe tomography reconstructions, and we looked at samples taken from across one of these hexagonal hillock structures. So we can see S1, which was taken from a flat region outside of the hillock structure, has a number of these cluster defects, while S3, taken from well within the hillock structure, has a very uniform distribution of magnesium and fewer of these magnesium clusters. However, in all areas of the film, the same total amount of magnesium was incorporated. So we've shown that there's an improved magnesium incorporation efficiency within hillock structures, um, which leads to a higher quantum efficiency and a higher p-type uh, behavior of the material. And as a result, we have um, higher uh, quantum efficiency photocathode structures grown on high hillock density films. I would like just to take a moment to say thank you to all of the members that are on my thesis committee, as well as my lab mates and former colleagues in the Wideband Gal Optronics Laboratory, as well as all of the students at CNSC that have helped me with my project and our external collaborators, as well as funding from NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Vincent Myers. Uh, I am a third year PhD student in the lab of Dr. Shadi Shahedpur Sandvik, the Wide Band Gap Optronics Lab. Um, so before I get started, I'll just uh, make brief mention of why I'm, why I'm here, what, what drew me to SUNY Poly. Uh, I got an undergrad in physics uh, from Houston Baptist University uh, and then tried to figure out what to do, got a master's degree in electrical engineering at Texas Tech University. From there, I decided I really, really wanted to work with wideband gap uh, semiconductors. It seemed like an exciting area of research. And uh, in particular, of the many uh, amazing distinguished faculty at SUNY Poly, uh, Shadi Shahedapur Sandvik's lab uh, seemed ideal for what I wanted to do with my research and with my career. So I applied and, and joined. So uh, with that today, I'll be talking about a central part of my PhD thesis research. Uh, namely the microwave annealing and activation of uh, P-type GAN for future power electronics. Change slides, there we go. Uh, first, I'll introduce the usefulness of GAN as a power electronics substrate. Um, the, uh, power electronics is most generally defined as the conversion and control of electrical power through uh, electronic circuit elements. In solid state, uh, some architectures do this. Uh, that do this include FETs, inverters, thyristors, IGBTs, and others. Now, silicon has dominated this space since the 1960s, but we uh, have reached slash slash are reaching the theoretical limits of uh, silicon's performance as a material. So, for future applications like uh, the automotive drivetrain uh, schematic shown in the figure on the right. Uh, we will need other materials. 
specifically wide band gap materials like silicon carbide and GAN uh, to, uh, to develop these systems. Since they have high breakdown fields that increase the absolute power handling uh, and the power to, to, to weight ratio of the power electronics themselves. In particular, uh, gallium nitride's high critical field, high saturation and high saturation velocity hold promise for next gen uh, high power switches. The figure on the bottom left shows the critical parameters of the specific on resistance uh, of some different materials that are commonly used, silicon, silicon carbide, and GAN. This uh, uh, line tracing the balance uh, trade-off of the voltage break, the maximum voltage breakdown of a material versus its minimum R on state shows the advancement of each of the materials and the dots indicate the best devices that have been developed. So as you can see, silicon is pretty close to its theoretical limit. Silicon carbide is closer, but, uh, but not quite at its the theoretical limit. However, as you can see from the blue dot scan has quite a bit of work that needs to be done in order to achieve that, that theoretical maximum efficiency. Um, so, uh, excuse me, I lost my place. Um, so uh, high efficiency doping with uh, concentration of electrical carriers of above 10 to the 19 is typically required to fabricate efficient power electronic devices, but this poses a challenge in GAN because while in-type doping is very efficient, uh, the P-type dopants available uh, for GAN, this is magnesium, mean that uh, uh, a very high concentration of magnesium is needed to inject into the material in order to get high carrier concentrations. Uh, often temp annealing temperatures of in excess of 1200 degrees are needed to activate the material efficiently. However, temperatures this high often lead to severe degradation of the material. So more efficient P-type GAN doping is critical for the future uh, of high power GAN devices and we need to be able to anneal the material without decomposing it. So I'll review some of the approaches that uh, researchers are currently taking to this problem and then focus on the approach of my research. To dope GAN, one of the effective approaches is through ion implantation. This allows control of the concentration of dopants uh, as well as the area uh, that's doped so that the sometimes complicated structures needed to form power electronics can be created. To activate these p-type dopants without using extremely high pressure, it's required to anneal them in a non-equilibrium regime. Because magnesium atoms can electrically activate at timescales faster than decomposition can take place, the material can be heated and cooled quickly to take advantage of this. And there are, there are three methods in the literature that are, that are being used to accomplish that. Uh, one method is laser annealing in which above band gap light selectively heats the surface, shown here within the, about the range of one absorption depth, in a very fast, usually nanosecond pulse to activate the magnesium. Uh, this is effective at activating the dopant, but unfortunately, because you're using a laser to do it, the, the area of the annealing is usually limited to about a centimeter squared. The most successful method to date is the second, is multi-cycle multi rapid thermal annealing. In this method, uh, material is heated rapidly over the course of seconds or tens of seconds to up to 1400 degrees Celsius and then rapidly cool down before material degradation uh, proceeds. However, to perform annealing with this method, a uh, relatively high nitrogen overpressure of about 24 atmospheres is required. Finally, um, I'll focus on uh, this method, microwave annealing, which is the, the subject of my work. It utilizes both uh, thermal and non-thermal heating mechanisms uh, to interact with the GAN, activate and activate the magnesium. The beam couples selectively with defects and highly doped layers, and it can heat at hundreds of degrees Celsius per second and applied to areas, uh, production scale areas of up to six inches, six inch wafers. And uh, I'll now describe this method in a bit more detail. A sample of a semiconductor, in this case GAN, is placed in a nitrogen pressure vessel with a microwave window, in this case quartz, at the top. A gyrotron operating at 60 gigahertz um, generates a microwave beam with an approximately Gaussian intensity profile that's larger than the sample, allowing the whole sample to be heated very rapidly. This is then, the temperature is then read with a pyrometer and controlled uh, by an external control software system 
to generate this heating profile, similar to the SMARTA method that I discussed uh, a moment ago. Now, microwaves absorb differently in different materials depending on their properties. The absorption can be modeled as, uh, as kind of a generic problem of the attenuation of RF power in a lossy dielectric. This attenuation is exponential with decreasing resistivity, as I show in the figure on the top right, using some sample values that are typical of GAN. And it's also uh, exponentially related to increasing electric field intensity, which correlates with the, uh, the beam power itself. Now, the interaction of the beam with the material has non-thermal effects as well. Microwave resonance with individual defect centers in the material can inject more energy than the bulk energy uh, provided by the surroundings, enabling the change in state and location of individual defects within the material. This uh, annealing produces a complicated set of effects and multiple approaches are needed in order to study it. So we can study what's happening in the material by studying its uh, luminescence. Irradiating it uh, with above band gap light causes luminescence of the defects within the band gap that affect the electrical properties. A detailed study of this luminescence can give us information about the response of the substrate, in this case GAN, to a given annealing condition. By annealing the material with p-dopants in one region and n-type dopants in another, we can form a diode. Analysis of the diode's performance can give information on how efficiently the p-type dopants are activated. We can also study the response of the crystalline structure to implantation and annealing under various conditions, in this case varying pressure. Uh, uh, using uh, XRD or X-ray diffraction. Distortion and recovery of the crystal lattice by implantation and then annealing has an effect on the strain and ultimately on the band structure of the material. So studying the effects of implant and annealing is critical to our ability to form devices. So in summary, uh, a study of the electrical, the optical and the structural evolution of GAN allows deep physical understanding of the material, which in turn allows us to develop the technology to enable uh, the future power electronics that are described at the beginning. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the funding of this work by the Department of Energy's ARPA-E, uh, as well as to my advisor, my current and former colleagues, as well as all of the amazing staff at CNSE who enable so much of this work to proceed. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, at, at this time, I'd like to open it um, up to questions and also mention that um, our Director of Graduate Admissions is also here with us. So feel free to ask any admissions related questions um, or anything about the graduate program in general, master's or PhD to our students. Um, so um, I think we have one question from Yash. Do you wanna start? Hi, hello, good morning. Uh, good morning. Is there any research ongoing on the carbon nanomaterials in your institute? Carbon nanomaterials? Yeah, carbon Sir? nanomaterials. Um, Krista, I can answer that. Thank you. Um, so at, when I was an undergrad, I did an internship at CNSC and I worked uh, with Dr. Jiang Li and he works extensively on carbon nanomaterials, graphene and carbon nanotubes. He was actually the um, inventor of the carbon nanotube FET um, and his group still is heavily involved in carbon um, materials research and then also moving into 2D materials and, um, and quantum materials as well. Can you repeat the name of the professor? Yes. Uh, Dr. Ji Ung Lee. His last name is Lee, L E E. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? You're very quiet. How's it going? Hi, good. How are you? Doing okay. May I ask a question? Of course. Um, so, to all the graduate students out there, so um, I was just wondering, like, what is, I mean, before this whole uh, Kind of new way that we're living now set in um how, what, what did an average like day for you guys kind of uh look like from when you came into the lab till when you like left like what, what was an average day like over at cnsc i'm sure it's different it's for very all. lab dependent yeah it depends on your project and yeah, everything so if you have like writing a paper so it 
kind of like different. So you have to kind of manage your time, partly in lab and then partly writing the paper. So for me um, personally, I like to write in library. So I would go to the library in the mornings and then come to lab later. Um, but if you have like long experiments, I've, I've been here until like four in the morning too. Like it depends really on the project um, and like how you actually can manage your time. So yeah, some days it's only a couple hours and then you can, you have time to write, read papers and like it's cool. Um, but some days you can have really long experiments. That, that's how it is for me. I don't know about um, other labs though. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it, uh, it really does. It really does vary quite a bit by the group. Um, I can and can speak to experience in, in my lab and in Shadi's lab. Um, so the our, our group is uh, very team oriented. So we have uh, five students all in the same area. Uh, we discuss our uh, our own projects that we're kind of running on our own for our thesis project frequently, and we discuss our projects with each other. Uh, so we can share ideas and, you know, ask questions about technical content and progress. We run on um, a pretty standard kind of normal, normal business hours. We normally uh, start at, at nine and wrap up around six. Uh, oh, that's often, nice. <laughs> often, of course, it, it goes, it goes a bit later than that. If a test is running or an experiment is, uh, is running late. Um, but uh, it's, it's like a, I wouldn't say it's like a normal job. It's like a, like a very demanding normal job you, where you kind of have to learn to balance your time between teaching yourself fundamentals, doing analysis of your data, collecting data, uh, you know, having, having research meetings with sponsors, et cetera. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah. I think um, a lot of us that are on the call are um, kind of more uh, advanced graduate students. So, for us now, um, after your third year, you kind of are done with your classes and your coursework. And so that day is very much focused on, you know, just doing your research, discussing with your lab mates, writing papers and working towards your thesis. Um, but in the first like two years, um, two to three years of the graduate program, um, there's a lot more classes that you're taking. Um, so you typically have two, maybe three classes a day. Um, and so that gives you, maybe you'd go to lab in the morning and work nine to noon, and then you'll have your classes and then you'll come back and, and do some more research work and lunch with friends somewhere in the middle. So. Good. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for answering my question, everyone. Um, I just want to kind of hear it from from um, the like the team there. Like, what do you think is uh, probably the biggest benefit of working in a collaborative environment uh, concerning these uh, high level projects? Because um, I know there's a lot, a heavy interdisciplinary element there. Um, so, do, what's like probably the best added benefit to being able to collaborate and and sort of like uh, I guess cross bridge a lot of a lot of disciplines there? What, what do you what do you guys think? Like, um, I should... Oh, Nusha, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so for me, um, I think the benefit mainly was that I had a lot of input uh, from people who had very different perspectives. And so it, gave, it provided me with an opportunity to approach my project and all of the different angles that are possible instead of maybe one or two standard angles that people would traditionally approach the project in. So um, I guess the other benefit is also that with all of those different perspectives, you tend to usually progress more uh, in your field than uh, having just uh, one or two perspectives. So that is what uh, was the main benefit for me. Um, I agree with Pujita. And even if it's in your field and you think, oh, I know this subject pretty well, it's always nice to hear from other people and you actually learn a lot from different perspectives as um, Fujita said. Yeah, for, for, for all of our projects, um, they're typically advanced research and as such are, are fairly specialized, but fundamentals still, you know, your knowledge of fundamentals still makes or breaks your ability to advance in your work. 
So if you have other people who are working in a related field, they may have some insight into, you know, the, the fundamentals of, of what they're doing may be slightly different from those of what you're doing. But if you can get input from those different kind of really like low level uh, feedback on like the physical mechanisms of what you're doing, it can really enhance your ability to see your own work clearly and creatively. Yeah, definitely. Huh? Yeah, like in my lab, um, I've, I've, because of the people that come into it, I've had like electrical engineers, biologists, biochemists, material science, uh, undergrad majors, all give me feedback on uh, my approach. And so it's, you got all this, uh, all these different sources of knowledge that are coming together as well that you can pick their brains for. Awesome. Great. Okay, so Christopher wrote in the chat box, um, the presentations were great. For the cathode photo detector, how much bandwidth can be obtained from a system using the device for online of site communications? Thanks. Um, thank you for that question, Christopher. Um, so for my devices, um, I'm not really sure. So, um, the work that I'm working on is um, the material development, so optimizing the materials and the layers of materials um, to perform with the highest efficiency. Um, so I know the non-line of sight communication systems rely on atmospheric scattering, um, so it kind of like beams up a signal and then scatters through the atmosphere and then you're detecting it. Um, and so it's really important to have as, as many of the photons that you can collect um, to, to be part of that signal. Um, but uh, I'm not really involved in the application, so I'm not sure about like the, the actual bandwidth number there. Thanks, Emma. Any other questions? Are there any comments from, from our PhD students about, you know, maybe highlights or, you know, your favorite part of CNSE or um, research or how you chose CNSE? I know some people have kind of touched on that, but anything you guys want to add that maybe would be helpful to somebody who's thinking of grad school? Choose the advisor that you want to work with. I think that is so important, having somebody that inspires you and pushes you um, and is doing research that's exciting to you, um, as opposed to just a, just a school in general. That, that would be my advice. Yeah. Also, don't, don't, don't forget to uh, sometimes push back against your advisors as well. <laughs> I mean, they've gone through this entire process themselves, uh, but they kind of forget sometimes. So uh, have them understand as well that it's not just research. Like you're coming in in the first time, so you need to go through classes. You need to go through the exams. You need to go through the qualifying exams. So you need to uh, have a little bit of pushback as well. Don't always just nod your head and yes, yes, yes. You have to understand that you need to do these things well, understand them, otherwise it's not gonna help you in the future. I would, uh, I would reiterate what, what Emma said. I was, when I finished my master's, there were, there's a lot of institutions that, did, that do wideband gap semiconductor research. Um, some of the labs are better known, some of them are less known, but I got some very good advice, you know, leaving my master's degree, looking for a PhD that the advisor is the most important variable. It's more important than the institution. It's more important than the name of the lab, anything. That's, um, that's kind of what brought me to, to SUNY Poly um, and absolutely advice that I would share with any you know, future prospective grad student. Um, I think for me, the main benefit of CNSC is that it's highly focused on research um, instead of the courses. So from the early on, you get exposed to all these amazing high tech uh, research that's being done in different labs and you can actually choose which one is like the right uh, fit for you. Um, I think that's that's what makes it different from other universities. So like at my at the university that I got my master's it was like a great university and all um, but it wasn't 
as heavily focused as re on research as CNSC is. Um, and I think CNSC also has very um, professional vibe to it. I don't know, I think other students can attest to that. Um, so it's, I think it's a great experience um, and can for sure prepare you for a more professional environment for your career and all that. I kind of agree with what Emma said, but um, apart from choosing an advisor based on um, just what kind of research they're doing, I'd also say try to align your working styles because uh, a lot of times issues that graduate students face is that some of them like working independently, some of them uh, like direction, and um, some advisors tend to provide a lot of direction while others don't. And so if your working styles don't match, then you end up having uh, a lot less productive uh, of a PhD journey and you end up being frustrated. And it's very important that your working styles match really well, apart from your interests matching. And a lot of times um, it's important that your working style matches more than your, um, in your interest in uh, you know, a particular kind of work. And all that to say, we have amazing professors here at CNSC. Like we are so lucky. They are all super interesting people and they want to get to know you as a person and, and want you to get to know them as well. Um, and are so involved and interested in your research, whether they're your advisor or not. They are really interested to hear about what you're working on, to share what they're working on um, and to just have this great research community. Great, thanks everyone. Alicia, do you have anything to add? Uh, maybe from an admissions standpoint? Um, I don't have anything specific to add, just you know, um, students who did get the invite from me, that's my direct email. Um, if you have any follow-up questions about the admissions process, please let me know. Um, the fall 2020 application is open now, still open. Um, typically our, our, dead, our absolute deadline is July 1st, but with everything going on with the pandemic, we're definitely going to be flexible um, with that, but we still have plenty of time. Um, and our spring 2021 application is open and our fall 2021 application is open. So um, taking applications for all three of those start terms. Great, thank you. Yeah. So if there aren't any questions, um, we do have again. one more oh, question. Sorry. We do have one more question from Christopher. Sure. Oh, sorry, Christopher. Yeah, I see that in there. Okay. In the Institute, when do you choose or are assigned an advisor? So um, that one um, I can help with. So um, it varies. I mean, sometimes students have a sense of who they want to work with and they've had conversations with that faculty member. Um, and um, so from, from the beginning, um, they are, you know, prepared um, to start right away with that person. Um, we also have students that start and kind of aren't sure and may do some rotations within a particular discipline. Um, so it, it does vary. Um, I do think that it's great to kind of have a sense of what you want to do because it's quite a commitment um, to come to especially a PhD program, um, but it does vary. So, so you do have time, um, but um, we do have students that, that know right away and start with that faculty member on day one. So feel free students to chime in and, you know, add anything <laughs> if you'd like. All the, uh, all the faculty have um, pretty, uh, pretty comprehensive uh, research pages on the SUNY Poly website, or on the SUNY CNSC website rather. Um, and you can, you can explore a lot of what they do, what they publish, um, on on that and you can uh, you can you can reach out to advisors individually as well okay i i don't think we have any more questions in the chat box and um, unless anybody else has any questions, I think we will conclude. So thanks so much for joining. Um, thanks to our um, presenters again. You guys are great. And um, we um, hope to 
to see you soon or see your applications um, or, um, you know, feel free to email any of us. We're happy to, to help um, field questions following today's event. So thanks again and stay safe and um, we'll see you soon.